You are listening to The Addiction Files, where we discuss evidence-based treatment, clinical pearls and resources, while striving to destigmatize the treatment of addiction in our medical culture and save lives. We are The Addiction Doctors, Dr. Darlene Peterson and Paula Cook. Welcome to The Addiction Files. We are thrilled to have Dr. Mason Turner back, and we are just finishing up our series on mental health disorders and addiction, and we are discussing psychotic disorders in in the nuances of addiction disorders as well. So it we couldn't find a better person than Dr. Turner to join us. And so we're just so thankful that he is willing to come and discuss this with us again. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Turner to give us a, another introduction and get us started on this topic. Well, thank you so much for having me back, and I really am excited to talk about this topic and how we can actually help patients who present with psychotic disorders and other uh, psychotic conditions. Uh, So my name is Mason Turner, and I'm a psychiatrist and addiction medicine physician and the senior medical director for the Behavioral Health Clinical Program for Intermountain Health based in Salt Lake City. Great. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Turner, just kind of start us out with, tell us about just psychotic disorders in general. So differentiate a little bit that to us when, how do we diagnose this? What are the different types? And explain to us how we can recognize those when, we're, when that's presenting to us. Sometimes these, these symptoms seem very similar. And particularly in our situation, it can be really hard sometimes to figure out what's going on. Definitely. And I would start off by really looking at what is psychosis? How do we define psychosis and how we recognize it in our patients? Oftentimes, patients don't come in with a chief complaint of psychosis, and so we have to do a little bit of work to figure out what is really going on and what are we actually looking for and what questions do we ask to actually uncover psychosis in our patients. So very simply put, if we look at a very high level with uh, psychotic symptoms, psychosis is impaired reality testing. And so I always like to start off with that umbrella because oftentimes we get caught up in the auditory versus visual hallucinations, paranoia. Uh, ideas of reference, uh, those kinds of issues. And really what we're looking at are impaired reality testing and symptoms that go along with that. And so what does that mean exactly? That means that the patient in front of us is having trouble differentiating what is real, subjectively real, I should say, but what we'd all characterize as being a, a reality of a situation versus what's going on internally for that person. And they can't actually distinguish those two things. So if we think about auditory hallucinations, for example, The impaired reality testing piece is that the person can hear those voices. They may have some kind of idea that maybe they're actually not present because they can't see them, but yet they're not able to actually grasp the reality that they're hearing a voice of someone who is not actually physically present. And so as we begin to kind of think about, we identify the impaired reality testing, and oftentimes I will actually ask questions of patients about what their sense of reality is and whether or not they feel as if the symptoms they're experiencing are actually uh, real or are they not real. We do have to approach some of those questions very carefully with patients because the experience for them is very much one of a a real symptom, a real voice they're hearing. They really feel like they're being monitored, chased, followed, those kinds of things. And as we go into those conversations with patients, we want to be aware of the fact that we need to be empathic with that experience, not validate the experience necessarily, but be empathic about how we ask those questions. And of course, then as we begin to identify that perhaps there's a psychotic process that's going on, we want to begin asking some of those questions around auditory hallucinations, seeing visions, feeling as if people are chasing you, following you, some of those paranoid ideation questions. And then oftentimes patients will then open up and tell us some additional bizarre thought content that we want to focus on. Mason, I have a question. How often do you see people who have psychosis, whether it's on some spectrum of like mild versus severe, who have some degree of insight that their reality testing is impaired? They're like, well, I really feel like someone's chasing me or out to get me. But you know, I know that can't be true. Or is it always they're out to get me? I have people who are, you know, have staked out of my house and they're watching me through my blinds. Can you have insight or is it always just complete? you know, complete belief that their reality is true? That's a great question. And in fact, actually part of the psychotherapeutic treatment of psychosis, which until about maybe 15 years ago, people thought you couldn't actually provide psychotherapy to people with psychotic disorders 
But we now know we can actually walk patients through a process to at least question whether or not the symptoms are actually based in reality or not. Oftentimes, they will not acknowledge and say, I know that's not a real thought. I know that's not a real feeling. But if we can at least get them to think about the alternative that perhaps it's not real, perhaps this is something that actually is a symptom that's being generated by uh, chemicals in my, my brain or neurotransmitters that have run amok a bit, then we begin to think about kind of the patient being able to question that and definitely drive more perceptions and more insight into their condition. That's helpful. Thank you. And that actually, by the way, that is called cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis. And one of the modules in that particular treatment uh, methodology is really looking at improving insight. And frankly, that has been shown to be very, very effective, almost as effective as medications in certain respects. So again, a very, very important part of the treatment for psychotic disorders in general. Is that helpful? I'm kind of jumping ahead, but is cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis helpful for people no matter what the etiology of their psychosis is? Definitely it can be, although it's been most studied in chronic psychotic disorders, not episodic psychotic disorders, such as you might see with bipolar disorder with psychosis, major depression with psychosis. Those particular conditions really respond best to medication interventions. But people with chronic schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, even chronic substance-induced psychotic disorders can benefit from improving insight around those, those particular symptoms of those conditions. Fascinating. So would you go through the different kinds of psychosis like you just mentioned, I think that would be really helpful for our listeners. Definitely. And I think many people equate psychosis with schizophrenia. And that is one, certainly one aspect of a psychotic disorder and one diagnosis. But keep in mind that psychosis will show up in a variety of different contexts and a variety of different situations. So let me start off first with a personality disorder that's related to psychosis, paranoid personality disorder, and then schizoid and schizotypal personality disorders. I won't go into those disorders in great detail today, but I just want you to be aware and your listeners to be aware that sometimes psychosis is very much, uh, it's okay with the patient. They don't feel bothered by it. They feel that's part of their personality and it's just something that they actually incorporate into their, their daily lives and they're perfectly fine with that particular symptom. So one of the first questions I ask when I identify a psychotic condition or psychosis or symptoms, I really want to understand what is the functional impact to the patient? And are they bothered by that particular psychotic symptom? And that's actually important when we begin to treat psychosis because, frankly, patients who are psychotic and are not bothered by the voices that they're hearing, they're able to work or interact with their families or do whatever it is they would like to do from the functional standpoint. We don't need to be actually that concerned about treating it down and getting the psychotic symptoms all the way resolved because they're not really bothering the patients. But then when patients come in and they're very concerned about the psychotic symptoms, one that does tend to rule out a personality disorder, first of all. But then secondly, it really gives me some way to work with the patient around, well, let's talk about some therapies that may help you to minimize or lessen the intensity of that, or at least make it more tolerable for you as a person when you're hearing these voices and that kind of thing. So again, we identify the psychotic symptoms. We understand the functional impact, which is important, and the overall distress that those symptoms are causing the patient. And then we can begin to look at diagnostically where those psychotic symptoms may be coming from. Now, as we begin to kind of pull this apart a bit, I do want your listeners to know that diagnostically speaking, you don't have to get the diagnosis right the first time, the second time, or the fifth time. We treat all psychotic symptoms with the same medications and the same strategies. We may need to add certain medications to manage mood symptoms or other symptoms such as substance use and what have you. But at the same time, it's important to know you can really start with antipsychotics and then begin to sort out that diagnosis later. And sometimes that's actually very much required to get to the actual true diagnosis. So as we begin to think through those various diagnostic categories, the first question I usually want to know is, do we have some kind of mood symptoms on board with the patient? Is there a history of mania? Is there a history of major depressive episodes? Because that will point you in a direction of a combination of a mood disorder and a psychotic disorder and really help you to understand maybe what some of those next steps are as you add on treatments to the antipsychotics, you'll want to be sure you're looking for those mood symptoms as well. And those particular uh, groupings of symptoms map to a couple of disorders. The first is major depressive disorder with psychotic features. And typically the psychosis we see with depression is more of a delusion or perhaps more of a paranoia. There's usually a more, there's a more complex orientation of the psychosis more details around what's actually going on, not just voices being heard, but a complex delusion that actually has a lot of different elements that can be difficult to disentangle. And we see that a lot with major depressive disorder with psychosis. By definition, if you have major depressive disorder with psychosis, 
You can only have psychotic symptoms when you also have major depressive episodes. Very important diagnostically, those two travel together, hand in hand. The same with bipolar disorder with psychotic features. You have to have mood symptoms or a mood episode, either mania or major depressive episodes, traveling along with those psychotic symptoms. And in theory, both the psychotic symptoms should resolve as the mood symptoms resolve. And that oftentimes is very important diagnostically because those patients have a much better prognosis than schizoaffective disorder, which is when the psychosis is really traveling independently of the mood symptoms. So you can be psychotic when you're not depressed or manic, or you can be depressed or manic and not psychotic. And those patients tend to have poor prognoses and have a really more challenging outcomes. Now, we can also begin to talk a bit about substance-induced psychosis as well, which is very important to consider. And many of your listeners will be familiar with this particular condition. And in, in theory, by diagnoses, uh, the substance-induced psychotic disorders are psychotic symptoms that occur when someone is acutely intoxicated or persist shortly after the acute intoxication and technically go away as the substance use and the, uh, the levels of the substance in the bloodstream actually go away and, and go down and return to zero. Now, in clinical practice, I will say that that's a bit of a misnomer when we think about it clinically what happens with patients. That's according to diagnostic criteria. But in this age where we see a lot of high-potency THC products, we see a, a lot of methamphetamine, a lot of combinations of drugs together, it is not at all uncommon to see psychotic symptoms persist for a period of time after cessation of the substance use. And many providers, many psychiatrists will really want to see about a year's worth of symptom resolution, so no psychotic symptoms for about a year, in the absence of substance use before they really diagnose that substance-induced psychotic disorder that happened a year previously. And so typically, that's a, a more kind of contemporary way of thinking about substance-induced psychosis. But if you are in an acute care setting, an ER or hospital setting, you're going to tend to see that substance-induced psychotic condition resolve uh, and at least get better as the person's ready for discharge or as you're dispositioning them. Can you repeat that? So if you um, have no symptoms for a year after substance, after last substance use and resolution of the psychosis, you can cut, you can verify or you can feel confidently that it was substance-induced psychosis. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, let me repeat that whole thing, actually. So when we think about substance-induced psychosis, traditionally, we have considered substance-induced psychotic symptoms to be related to acute intoxication on a given substance. Oftentimes, methamphetamine is the one traditionally associated with psychotic conditions. You can have the psychosis persist for a day or two or maybe even up to a week after the effects of the substance wear off. But then really, if you have ongoing psychotic symptoms beyond that, then Traditionally, we have diagnosed a different psychotic condition that we would call a functional or primary psychotic condition. Hmm. However, in this age where we have more high-potency THC compounds, we have more recurrent use of methamphetamine, including intravenous use of methamphetamine, all of which really predispose to substance-induced psychotic conditions, we really are beginning to see more uh, conditions that actually may uh, resolve with or may improve as the substance wears off but may actually persist in a mild or attenuated fashion for quite some time after uh, the substance has really worn off and the blood levels in the, in the bloodstream have actually gone down to zero. So many psychiatrists really want to see a year of both abstinence from substances and a year with no psychotic symptoms where they conclusively state that it was a substance-induced psychotic condition rather than a primary psychotic condition. I should also add as well that oftentimes when we see substance-induced psychosis, it is in the age range of people who are in their late teens and 20s, early 30s, where most psychotic conditions are really beginning to declare themselves. And so there's a lot of diagnostic uncertainty sometimes when a 25-year-old comes in, new onset psychosis, has methamphetamine on board, and then maybe gets a little bit better over the next six months, maybe with or without antipsychotic treatment. And then really understanding what that diagnosis is can actually be quite a bit of a challenge. That's really helpful. There was one article that I read that said sometimes the lack of like negative affect symptoms sometimes helps you differentiate this from primary psychotic disorders. Is that helpful diagnostically sometimes when you see these people maybe three or four months later out from substance use and they're maybe improving? Is Could you maybe say this was maybe more substance use, but they're still displaying some of those psychotic symptoms? That's a great question. And in fact, actually, that is one of the clues that you're looking at a substance-induced psychosis versus a primary psychosis. The presence of negative symptoms, 
which again, are some of the cognitive symptoms that go along with schizophrenia, the social withdrawal, uh, really those kinds of negative symptoms that cause you to withdraw into yourself and really not be able to interact with people very well. Those negative symptoms actually drive the most functional impact for most schizophrenics, for example. And rarely do we see negative symptoms in an episodic substance-induced psychosis or frankly with bipolar disorder with psychotic features or major depressive disorder with psychotic features. So the presence of negative symptoms really does give you a clue that perhaps this is a schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. And also I think it does predict the functional outcomes. If you're seeing a lot of negative symptoms, we know that probably that person is going to have a more difficult course of their psychotic disorder. The negative symptoms also are really difficult to treat with medications or with psychotherapy. And oftentimes the work mm -hmm. is really helping patients to work with those symptoms and try to become as functional as they possibly can. That's great. That's really helpful. I have one more clarifying question. Um, when you were talking about, so by bi both bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder with psychotic features will present with mood symptoms and typically resolve, psychosis will resolve with the mood symptoms. And then were you talking about schizoaffective disorder, that the mood and the psychosis travel independently? Was it schizoaffective? Right. Okay, so right. that's because that's an interesting distinction that can be confusing, bipolar disorder with psychosis versus schizoaffective disorder with psych psychosis. So the difference is primarily the mood with psychosis that resolve together versus primary psychosis with affective symptoms that occur independently of psychotic features. That's right. And I would say that's according to our diagnostic criteria in DSM-5. If you look at clinical presentations of patients, there are many, there are many overlapping features between schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. So many psychiatrists actually believe that those two disorders are one set of diagnoses and the episodic bipolar disorder with psychotic features, major depression with psychotic features, have a separate kind of etiology when we look at the neurochemistry and the neurocircuitry in the brain. So again, it's useful to think about those two as two groupings, but by diagnostic criteria, that is correct. It really is about when the psychosis occurs relative to the mood symptoms. Well, that's very good. I've never, I haven't ever heard that. That makes it easy to remember. That would be really good for our learners too, who are studying for boards and who are trying to keep it straight on psychiatry rounds. So, and, but so going back to treatment, you're saying that treatment really is very similar no matter which of these presentations that's correct. If we look at treatments, usually the first treatment is going to be medication. And that's really very intentional because as you can imagine, if you have really severe psychotic symptoms, engaging in insight-oriented cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis will be very, very challenging. And we know that with antipsychotics, we can really get those psychotic symptoms treated very quickly. So this is not a situation where you start a medication like, say, for depression, and have to wait a month or six weeks for results to show up. You can see almost immediate impacts from using antipsychotics. And as I like to tell people that, you know, we have so many different choices for antipsychotics. There are probably 20 or more medications. My advice to your, your listeners is really figure out one or two medications that you want to use. I can certainly suggest a couple if you like, but a couple of medications you want to use, know those very well, know them inside and out and use those. And don't be distracted by the other medications that are coming out that are $50 a pill, $100 a pill, claiming it's much better than other treatments that are on the market really understand your medications and use just a handful of those medications that you know how they work and you use them well. Okay. So tell us which are those for you. I'll keep it a secret. I'm just kidding. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that basically there are, I would say three medications that I like to use for psychosis in particular. The first is olanzapine. And olanzapine is a really great antipsychotic. It has a lot of great uh, efficacy it actually can be used in a variety of forms. It can be used for emergent uh, agitation. It can be given intramuscularly. It can be given orally. They're dissolving tablets. There are a lot of different ways you can actually administer lanzapine, and it really is quite effective. And so in the acute care setting, that's probably my go-to antipsychotic. I really like that medication quite a lot. And the only downside of that is that it can cause massive weight gain. And so a couple of things to know about lanzapine and weight gain. Studies have really demonstrated that the weight gain is due to increased appetite. It is not a metabolic phenomenon. It is not some mysterious way of gaining weight independent of increased appetite. It actually is people have increased appetite, and it's always for refined carbohydrates. It's never broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and lettuce. It's going to be chips. It's going to be you know sugars, a candy, a really chocolates, things like things like that that are really difficult to set aside. 
And so what happens is patients eat because of the appetite, then they, of course, gain weight. And so we can actually get ahead of that a little bit by, one, letting patients know that they need to be on the lookout for increased appetite. It is almost never subtle. And so patients do, they do understand what's going on, and they'll come in and tell you, all of a sudden, I'm running through three bags of potato chips before I go to bed. And then there needs to be a conversation about, is this manageable? Is it not? Do we need to look for other uh, medication options? But you do know that within the first five weeks. And prevalence estimates with that particular side effect do vary a bit. Probably around 20% of patients will have some degree of increased appetite, with a much smaller group of patients having that really significantly increased appetite that leads to massive weight gain. So again, that's probably the most uh, common and the most difficult to manage side effect. Uh, there is a metabolic syndrome associated with uh, olanzapine, as it is with other antipsychotics as well. And that typically just requires uh, yearly monitoring. Uh, you want to monitor uh, cholesterol, glucose, things of that nature, just to make sure you're on top of that if that does occur. And there are various ways to actually manage those conditions if they do occur. Rarely is metabolic syndrome a reason we would stop the olanzapine if it's working well. So again, that's probably my number one go-to both in the acute care space and frankly also uh, with chronic long-term care as well. I will say another medication that I really uh, like quite a, quite a lot as well is a risperidone. That's one of the older atypical medications, but it has kind of a bit of some of the efficacy of those older medications like haloperidol, but it doesn't have as many of those side effects, and I found that to be a very effective medication. Now, I already can hear some of your listeners saying, those are two very old antipsychotics. Why don't we use some of the newer ones that claim to have fewer side effects and so forth? And there certainly are benefits to medications so like lorazidone for depression and bipolar disorder, or quetiapine for sedation, anxiety management, just generally kind of holding the glue together as somebody is getting into early abstinence. There really are indications for that. But when we talk about true psychotic symptoms, we need to really use medications that are effective. And those are the two that I usually go to first. And again, you may like those two, you may not, but I recommend you find your own two and make sure you understand those very well as you work with those with patients across the dosing spectrums. Now, in terms of the third medication, I would want all of your listeners, whether you're a psychiatrist, a family medicine doctor, anyone who's working with patients who have psychotic conditions, to at least have some knowledge of clozapine. A clozapine is an antipsychotic that is vastly underused and has some very important characteristics that are really important for the population of patients who are suffering with addictions. We know from a lot of studies that clozapine actually is superior in terms of treatment of psychotic conditions possibly mania as well, but definitely psychotic conditions. In fact, it's indication is for treatment-resistant psychosis, but it also has improved benefit for people with suicidal ideation as well as addictions. And so clozapine, you don't reach for that one first. You really want to have moved through two or three antipsychotics before you consider it, but it is very important to know a bit about clozapine. And if you don't prescribe it yourself, to know someone you can refer a patient to who will prescribe that medication. So again, clozapine is one I would want all of your listeners to be familiar with. I think that's fantastic. And yeah. I I can't, when I remember being a student and I was first introduced to it at the state mental hospital, that clozapine, it just, just in my short time there, watching just the transformation with patients on that was really, really eye-opening. And so I was glad to be actually exposed to that pretty early on. So I agree with you, Mason. And I'm glad to hear that, your advice on those medications. That's really helpful. Can I go back quickly to a question yeah, about the sure. treatment medications yeah. first? Um, this is a kind of rudimentary question, but do you see failure of antipsychotics primarily because of intolerability for, from side effects, or do you find that the medication just doesn't work? How commonly does it just not work, or is it side effect related? That actually is a very interesting question because oftentimes if you find a medication that works, patients will tolerate a lot of side effects. And I've actually been in a situation with patients before where I wanted to stop a medication because I was concerned about side effects. And the patient said, you know, this is the only thing that's worked for my psychosis. Please do not stop it. I've mm -hmm. had patients who had to come off uh, clozapine because of uh, neutropenia and those kinds of issues. And they really wanted to continue it because it was so effective for them. So I would put that as kind of a, just a caveat as you're thinking about this, that the efficacy with these medications Oftentimes, patients will really tolerate a lot of side effects. And we oftentimes, as uh, prescribers, physicians, are really in the position of really having to understand, is this safe for the patient or not? That's a fairly common occurrence. Now, back to your question, though, 
I would say most antipsychotics, especially olanzapine and risperidone, I found are, are typically very effective. And you can actually pull efficacy data from a variety of studies, some of which is mm-hmm. conflicting. And of course, there's a spectrum and what have you. But I would say those two medications, and certainly some that are on the stronger end of the antipsychotics, if you will. So also some of the typical antipsychotics like haloperidol, and then as well as some others, uh, such as paliperidone and some other analogs of other antipsychotics, those are all quite effective. Mm. What we really see sometimes is they're only 50% effective or 30% effective. And then we're really trying to understand, okay, we've gotten the psychosis controlled 30%. How is the functional outcome going? Are they able to actually interact with other people? Are they able to access psychotherapy? Are they able to actually go to the clubhouse, for example, and and really be among other people with psychotic conditions to be able to actually have a social network and a grouping? Looking at those functional outcomes is really important. And so it's all together, right? So if I got the psychotic symptoms better by 80%, but the functional outcomes are not following suit, well, then we need to look at other therapies. Mm-hmm. If I was able to get the psychotic symptoms you know, down by 20%, but yet the functioning has improved dramatically, that's probably a good medication for that patient. And then the tolerability issues, these medications will have a lot of side effects. And it's really about understanding what the patient is willing to tolerate and what is medically safe and we can manage another medical by using other medicines, for example. Mm, thank you. That's excellent. And then my second question is, do you have to do like a REMS training for clozapine and is it limited to psychiatry usage only? That's a great question as well. And I would say typically, yes, you do have to do a REMS training. And actually, it's a fairly, it's fairly difficult training, to be honest with you. It's a, you can do an open book, so you can actually learn a lot about uh, clozapine, but it's a fairly rigorous training because they want you to understand at what point you need to switch monitoring frequencies, when do you consider uh, stopping the medication, reducing doses, and so forth. And well, the RIMS monitoring program for clozapine is really around uh, neutropenia, a so-called agranulocytosis is the older term for that. Uh, that's really what the RIMS program is about. But clozapine causes a lot of other problems as well. Also, massive weight gain potentially as, as olanzapine. And then cardiomyopathy is another a particular side effect that has to be monitored as well, typically related to the, the rate and the speed of dose increases. For all of those reasons, most primary care providers, most family medicine practitioners really don't want to prescribe clozapine. You don't have to be a psychiatrist to do that, but typically I would say most of the time it is psychiatrists who are prescribing it. Mm -hmm. I have been to rural areas of the country, say in the state of Utah, Idaho, and so forth, where the PCPs actually are trained in clozapine and are prescribing it because there's no other choice. Mm -hmm. And so they can be trained and prescribed that, but you want to make sure that you're very well aware of the protocols and how you get to a decision to start clozapine and how you do the monitoring as well. Perfect. Thank you. Well, that's great. Mason, can you explain, just some go over some of the drugs, like which ones are more likely of the illicit substances that patients are using that are going to cause um, psychosis? And what's that frequency? And how long do we expect those psychosis, those psychotic symptoms to last? With each of those. Well, of course, I'd be remiss not to start with methamphetamine. I think that's the one most of your <laughs> listeners are, are very well aware of for good reason. And the reason is because methamphetamine causes massive release of dopamine in the brain, and methamphetamine is also a very long acting compound. So, depending on the type of methamphetamine and other ways that it's formulated, it really can be in, in your system for 12 hours or more. And so, because of that, massive release of dopamine, long action of the substance. And then, of course, people are using the substance compulsively, increasing those blood levels, more dopamine release, and that increased dopamine in certain parts of the brain will result in psychotic symptoms. We know that very clearly. Many years of study have shown us that increased dopamine in certain parts of the brain is what causes psychotic symptoms. So clearly, if you're increasing the dopamine in your brain, you will be at risk for substance-induced psychosis. And so that is the one classically associated with this condition. It does vary a bit depending on whether it's intravenous use, whether it's smoking, snorting, what have you. There are various ways that actually, as you get that blood level up higher and more quickly, they can be more prone to psychotic symptoms. But in general, we we can see psychotic symptoms regardless of the way it's being used and regardless of the length of time that they're using the substance. Almost always, if they show up into the acute care setting, we medicate those symptoms. Again, very important with these symptoms Don't say, well, let me just wait until the substance is gone and then the psychosis will go away. Hit those symptoms with antipsychotics. And typically, I'm very aggressive with the dosing because we want the person to get some rest. We want to shut down all of the dopamine on those receptors and then be able to uh, get them out of that psychotic condition quickly. 
That's the majority of cases. Now, people who use methamphetamine chronically, and they're probably this also may be with other stimulants as well. Uh, cocaine is one that also we do see this with our crack cocaine in particular. People who use those substances chronically and for long periods of time it is not that uncommon to see a primary psychotic disorder develop that persists after cessation of use. And I could share some patient examples from this over the years where people have literally been off methamphetamine for 10 years or more, and the psychosis is actually still really refractory. That is probably due to some permanent alterations in the way the brain processes dopamine and some of the neural circuitry. And unfortunately, those are very difficult patients to treat, and that does occur. And typically, what I tell patients about that, because sometimes people will ask me, well, I'm just psychotic when I'm using, and when I'm not using, I'm not psychotic, what's the big deal? Right. I just need to make sure and don't get in you know, get into a situation that I can't get out of. Well, what I tell people is that if they notice the psychotic symptoms are persisting, say a day or two or a week after they stop using methamphetamine, I get very, very worried because that's really telling me that the brain is having trouble processing and regulating that dopamine secretion and that particular neurotransmitter in certain parts of the brain. So then we have a really very intentional conversation about what's happening and that there's probably long-term permanent damage that's occurring. So that's methamphetamine. And typically, I will treat those conditions for at least three to six months after cessation of use, just to be a little neuroprotective. And I do like to actually continue those antipsychotics even after they stop using for that reason, just to make sure that their, their brain has every chance to actually heal and recover. So that's kind of to the length of time in the question with methamphetamine. Now, there are 100 caveats that I could give about this particular question, but there's one of them I want to make sure everyone is aware of. Many people who use substances of any type are not sleeping, right? So you're going on a, a use pattern for four, five, six, seven days, you're not sleeping. And we know that lack of sleep causes psychotic symptoms. So occasionally you'll see somebody come in, say with uh, alcohol, for example, there is an alcoholic hallucinosis that can occur. So there are psychotic symptoms associated with that. That's actually pretty unusual. But people who are on a, a bender with alcohol, for example, for many days or a week or so are not sleeping very well. They can come in looking psychotic. And the treatment for that is here's some olanzapine, go to sleep for, you know, 12, 24, 36 hours, whatever you need. And when you wake up, let's reassess and kind of where you are in terms of, of those psychotic symptoms. And those patients, oftentimes you can really pick those out as long as you ask questions about how they're sleeping and how long they've gone without sleep. So that's Again, very important to keep in mind as well. Now, we should talk a bit about cannabis and THC, though, as well. And I think... Yes, absolutely. Many, <laughs> many people, especially people in my generation and older, have a certain viewpoint of cannabis that is not the reality of the situation in 2024. This simply is not how cannabis is being sold, marketed, and produced these days. Uh, if you look over the course of, say, since the 1960s, the potency of cannabis that you might purchase either illicitly or in a dispensary has probably tripled or quadrupled or possibly even more. And you've got more products that actually are high potency, a THC containing products like dabs. And so we look at the literature around cannabis. It used to be thought that for people who were going to develop schizophrenia, that cannabis uh, uncovered a psychotic disorder that possibly would have been uncovered at some point in later time, five or six years, the cannabis accelerated that presentation. There now is a school of thought with these higher potency compounds that we actually may be causing a schizophrenia in someone who's already susceptible. So this is someone who's genetically susceptible to schizophrenia, has early exposure to cannabis, and they actually develop schizophrenia when without that exposure, they would not have developed it. And this has gotten me very nervous, right? Because Somebody who is genetically susceptible is probably more likely to use cannabis for a variety of reasons, and they're more likely to use a high-potency compound. What's going to happen from a public health perspective in those situations, and how are we going to see psychotic symptoms follow with that and psychotic disorders? And I tell all of my patients that if they're using cannabis, please do not advance yourself to dabs or 100% THC-containing compounds. Those can actually cause a really severe mania, a really severe psychotic condition it takes a while to actually uh, treat and actually recover from. So that's a particular category that I really do warn people about pretty systematically. The other piece of advice that I would give your listeners around THC and cannabis, you may have seen a patient for the last 10 years, and you know they're a daily user of cannabis, tolerated it just fine. They all of a sudden come in with paranoia, they come in with some other psychotic symptoms, 
and you're suspicious that maybe the cannabis is causing it, but something in the back of your head says, well, they've been smoking for 10 years on a daily basis. This really can't be the cannabis. My next question to the patient is, did you change your source where you're getting your cannabis? Did you change what type of cannabis you're using? Did you go from, say, smoking a joint to actually vaping uh, marijuana or something along those lines? Or did you move to a wax product or some other high-potency oil? Because oftentimes that is what's actually occurring. They're becoming psychotic because of changes in their use patterns and potency. So again, very important to have that in the back of your mind and realize that the cannabis that we all kind of assessed and worked with 15, 20 years ago is not the cannabis that people are using today. Yes, we could not agree more. <laughs> could I say so it better? Valid. Thank you for saying that and going over it so carefully. We all see this, I think, clinically every day, and it's kind of heartbreaking, especially with the reduced perception of harm around cannabis in general. And we see younger and younger people using cannabis, which makes us very nervous. There's a fair amount of research with cannabis use in, in youth, especially under the age of 25. There is some long-term you know, reprocessing of, of the brain as it begins to grow and mature and really pairs down some of those connections. Uh, as you may be aware, we're born with many more neural connections and frankly, even brain tissue in some cases than we have as we age. And the maturation cycle kind of ends around 25. Most people would agree that's probably the age. Some believe it's a little bit later, maybe more like 28 or 30. But we can say it's about 25 years old. And anything you expose your brain to prior to age 25, frankly, including nicotine, is going to change your receptor densities. It's going to change your neurotransmitter concentrations and may actually rewire some of that circuitry. So anyone under the age of 18 for sure, but even under the age of 25 who's using cannabis regularly, we have a, a very intentional conversation about what exactly is going on neurobiologically and the reason that I'm actually telling a 19-year-old it's a really bad idea for you to be using cannabis right now. Absolutely. So, Mason, I'm putting you on the spot. So, with your big brain, tell us the prevalence and when we should be suspecting. So, primary psychotic disorder versus depression with psychotic disorder versus schizoaffective. These different disorders, how common are they? So, when someone's presenting... What should I be expecting just on how prevalent they are? That this is a fantastic question, Darlene, because I think it actually goes to some of the clinical pearls about diagnosis that are super important. And if we look at the prevalence in general, so let's take substance out of the picture for a second. Mm -hmm. Schizophrenia has about a 1% prevalence rate in the population. Bipolar 1 disorder, about a 2% prevalence. So again, bipolar 1 is a manic episode and usually a major depressive episode as well. Does it have to be the case? But typically you have both kind of going together. So that's about 2% of the population. Bipolar 2, primarily a depressive illness, is about 2% of the population. That is a major depressive episode with hypomania, which really doesn't usually bother people. It's really the depression. So bipolar 2 is about 2%. As we then begin to move through the spectrum, major depressive disorder is probably sitting at around 12 to 14%, depending on whether you want to look at prevalence over a period of time. Mm -hmm incidents, what have you. I mean, there are various ways to cut that. Most of the time we say about 20 to maybe 22% of people have a lifetime major depressive episode. But again, those numbers are a bit fluid. So we'll kind of have that, that particular caveat. And then anxiety disorders, the most common uh, psychiatric disorders affect upwards of 30, 35% uh, of people during their lifespan. So again, when you think about it and you think about what's common, Really, you need to screen for a major depressive disorder with psychotic features and bipolar disorder with psychotic features, even before you're screening for schizophrenia. And I think that's really important for people to hear because sometimes we see the psychotic symptoms. That's what's obvious. That's what's driving a lot of the presentation and the functional impairment. And we may not be as attuned to the fact this person has been depressed for 20 years and has had six major depressive episodes, and we've got to treat the two concurrently. And in fact, with major depressive disorder with psychotic features, there is a school of thought that is backed by evidence that if you actually treat the depression with antidepressants or TMS or ketamine, ketamine probably not because of the psychotic elements there, but if you do actually treat the depression by any mechanism, the psychosis will resolve without using antipsychotics. That's how closely linked those two are together. So again, keep in mind, that's what's going to be common. Make sure you screen for that as you're beginning your treatment for the psychotic symptoms and then you begin to see the schizophrenia showing up kind of further down the road, or at least a less, uh, frequently, less frequently. 
The substance-induced psychosis, though, is what we see in our ERs and our acute care centers. And so we don't typically see a first presentation of schizophrenia in the ER. We can, and we do sometimes. But usually we're seeing, especially in someone who's actually using substances, is a substance-induced psychosis until proven otherwise. So that's, again, going back to what I said earlier, treat the psychotic symptoms and worry about the diagnosis later. No, that's very sage advice. It's true. So one of the things with patients who have psychosis that I really like to emphasize uh, is that it is important for us as clinicians who probably have not had the experience of being psychotic in the past mm-hmm. to really try to understand what it is like to be in the brain of someone who's psychotic and how frightening and scary that is. And I've listened to people over the years. I've done a lot of work in acute care psychiatry, and I've listened to people, students, residents, interviewing psychotic patients. And I hear them saying things like, well, you know what's happening is not real. You know, the people that you're hearing are not really there. You know, the FBI is not really chasing you. And those are really well-intentioned efforts to improve insight. But at the moment that person is experiencing that, they don't know it's not real. And so it's very important as treatment providers, as we're actually interviewing patients, gathering that history and information, to really put ourselves in the patient's shoes just a bit and understand how frightening it must be for them to be in a situation where their reality testing is really, it's not intact. It's very difficult for them to know what's real and what's not. The other piece that I would throw out there is a pearl that I think is really important that we didn't talk a lot about is delusional disorders and delusions. Oh, yeah. Delusions typically are very complex. Uh, well, delusions, they're complex, have complex details. They're usually a very complex story behind most delusions. And typically, there, there are various elements uh, to the delusions that kind of come together in a way that is very bizarre. It sometimes is actually more frankly psychotic than at other times. Most delusions sound potentially a little bit plausible, possibly a lot plausible, but as you begin to dig into the details of that, you really understand and realize that, okay, there's really a psychotic process behind a lot of this. The challenge with delusions is that they don't respond to medications, and you can see why, right? This is a complex series of psychotic symptoms interacting in a way to further kind of reify those those delusional thoughts, and it becomes really like a cycle. It's very difficult for the patient to gain insight that this is really a delusion and not the experience that they're having. Frankly, we see this in the news as well around some of the conspiracy theories, for example. These are all quasi-delusions that are happening and get reinforced by a lot of different mechanisms. When we try to treat patients with delusions, what ends up happening is that we first try antipsychotics, and that's what I would do. We want to try that and see if it works. But oftentimes it doesn't work and we continue medications that may not be effective. And sometimes what we have to do is really help the patient to work around that delusion and understand how it affects their lives. And I could tell you many stories of people I've worked with over the years where the delusional behaviors and thoughts, I was able to get a little bit of headway with medications, but it really was some of the cognitive behavioral therapy work. It was understanding those alternative explanations and frankly, working around some of the details and facts that were in these delusions Uh, in a way to try to help the patient to become more functional. So again, really important for listeners to understand that delusions, even though they are psychotic symptoms, are not the same as auditory hallucinations, paranoid ideation, and so forth, which are much more treatable with medications. I think that's such good advice. Is this back to where you talk about more CBT? Is that the mainstay of treatment for more delusional disorder? That would definitely be one of the options as well. Now, keep in mind, a lot of patients, we go back to this idea of impaired reality testing. Mm -hmm. The patient really doesn't always want to gain insight into the delusion. Maybe they've got a little bit of an idea that perhaps something about this is actually not real, or there's something that's a little bit overblown in terms of the details and how they link together. So oftentimes, the, the key there is really to say, how is this delusion affecting your life? Is it keeping you from going out and socializing with other people? going into you know, a restaurant or going in to go shopping or something along those lines. And then that's an entryway for a therapist to then come in and say, let's see if we can actually look at these concrete goals. Maybe one would be you want to be able to go into the grocery store once a week and see how we can actually work with you around gaining enough insight with those delusions to be able to do that. And so that's mm-hmm. usually how that would show up in terms of how we work with those delusions in a therapeutic context. Coming out of the bunker. A little yeah. bit, like, Correct. kind of thing. Correct. <laughs> Mason, do you see delusions with one particular type of psychosis? I mean, I know it's a standalone diagnosis in and of itself, but do you see it more commonly with, you know, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder? I would say that at least in clinical practice, and I couldn't cite evidence on this, to be honest with you, but I would say in clinical practice, I really have seen the delusions, which frankly, 
people with delusions tend to be more functionally intact than people with other forms of psychosis. So to put that out there, typically these patients are functioning at a higher level. And I do tend to see that more with those mood symptoms along with psychotic symptoms. We tend to see delusions as part of that psychotic thought process. Delusions as a standalone disorder have a lot of very interesting etiologies as well. And there have been a lot of uh, delusional disorders associated with a variety of conditions ranging from puberty to menopause to pregnancy. I mean, there's, it runs the spectrum. And some of those have held up and some have not. I think the take-home message there is that anything that perturbs the biochemistry in your body may actually lead to some kind of delusions or some kind of psychotic symptoms, but most of the time it does not. So again, looking at the surface of those symptoms and really not being too concerned about the etiology is usually important because oftentimes we can't actually figure it out. But I think you tend to see this less in people who are acutely psychotic, who come into like the acute care setting. And then maybe as you get the auditory hallucinations, the paranoia under better control, the delusions are kind of those residual symptoms that are very difficult to treat. I see that pretty commonly as well. Interesting. Just as, as a final thing, do you have do you want to say anything about postpartum depression with psychosis? I, I know that from my clinical time as a medical student, I, some of the most impactful patients I saw were psychotic women in the postpartum period. Is there anything to mention there or is it not common enough to discuss? Actually, that's a really good call out. And I think, you know, in terms of what I would want to say about postpartum mental health conditions, just in general, it is extremely common for women to have postpartum blues is the term that is used sometimes. And that's really the dysphoria that goes along with a kind of a post-delivery situation. Oftentimes, actually, you know, it's it's potentiated by some of the conditions like not being able to sleep or maybe being kind of isolated at home and not among work colleagues and other friends and what have you, oftentimes associated with the first pregnancy. That's more of a, a situational kind of dysphoria. Of course, bio, biochemical underpinnings with that. That's usually something the psychotherapy is very useful for, particularly around behavioral activation and understanding how to integrate a child care into your life and self-care and so forth. And a large percentage of women experience that, I think around 30 to 50%, if you look at some studies, it's again, very, very common. Postpartum depression, which has some very interesting definitions, but for your listeners, what I would say is that postpartum depression is any major depressive episode that occurs in the postpartum period. We psychiatrists like to really diagnose and we like to parse and we like to have diagnostic criteria and so forth. And so if you have an existing major depressive disorder that occurs and recurs during the postpartum period, we call it something else, major depressive disorder uh, with postpartum exacerbation. But it's the same thing as new onset postpartum depression in the postpartum period. So again, major depressive disorder, first year after birth, uh, medications are really the primary treatment. Psychotherapy is very effective as well. But most women, if not almost all women who have postpartum depression, really do need to be on medications. And there are safe medications to use both in breastfeeding and also during pregnancy as well. Again, that's usually the province of a maybe an OBGYN or a psychiatrist or a really well-informed PCP or family medicine doctor. So again, kind of keep in mind that that's a medication-based condition. And we really want to make sure that they get medications. Then you've got a very small subset of women who will develop postpartum psychosis. And that takes a lot of different forms. Uh, it could be psychotic symptoms in the postpartum period. It can be psychotic symptoms plus thoughts of harming their baby or harming themselves or harming you know, their spouse or any of a variety of individuals. But in my mind, and I think most of my colleagues in psychiatry would agree, any woman in the postpartum period who is psychotic, that's, a, that's an acute emergency and needs to be handled as such. These are not patients that we discharge back home because we sometimes see a progression of the psychosis and this oftentimes is associated with uh, infanticide and some other really horrible outcomes. So again, those patients, which are, are frankly, they're few, and thankfully they're few, those are really important emergencies and typically will, will require an inpatient hospitalization. Thank you for saying that. And I think that's really important for all our listeners to know that this is a psychiatric emergency and these women need to be taken seriously. Their family need to be heard. And they need to be admitted and they're and basically kept safe and taken care of. So thank you for saying that. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Turner. You are just a wealth of knowledge and we can't thank you enough for all that you have taught us. It's been a fantastic episode. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night. Well, thank you very much. Until next time. <laughs>
Hey, check us out at theaddictionfiles.com or email us at theaddictionfiles at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Ricky Valides for use of his song, Awake. Check him out at rickyvalides.com. purposes only. Hosts and guests are not responsible for any harm caused by information obtained from this source. As each person is unique, you're advised to seek the advice of your own healthcare professional to treat any medical conditions you may be having. Opinions expressed on this show are those of the addiction files and not of our respective employers.